Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, my name is Neil Thomas. Uh, I'm a Media and Communication Studies uh, uh, instructor at Laurier University. Um, the title of my talk today is Epistemic Relation as Social Relation. Um, I actually, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to uh, take in much of the conference so far, both because it's the first week, first week of classes for me and preparing for this moment right now. So I hope uh, that the conference has been going well, and I also hope that this doesn't come out come a little bit too far out of left field. Uh, it's going to be a lot more potentially a lot more philosophical than um, other stuff that you may have seen, uh, and I hope that that's uh, to uh, good effect and not uh, necessarily a bad thing. So, uh, what am I going to try to accomplish uh, in the sort of half hour that I'm going to be talking with you today? Um, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, some of the questions that I have, or the objectives uh, set in terms of questions are one to sort of communicate an improved understanding of how uh, the network formalizations that we kind of take for granted. Uh, in today's modern internet and web, uh, they uh, really sort of inevitably come to function as a material semiotic medium for collective thought. I'm going to spend a considerable amount of time kind of unpacking what that means from a very philosophical perspective, and hopefully it'll be uh, it'll be interesting and, and sort of engaging to you. Um, a main question that I, that would sort of drive the reasons why I would want to talk in these terms would be to sort of think about how different knowledge structures organize social production. So the idea that the models of thinking that are at work in computing and in computer science, and it turns out those have been sort of appropriated from philosophy to kind of drive what happens in computer science, that these are now so pervasive that we should really be thinking about them as a form of social production, meaning that they kind of constitute the social in ways that I'm going to describe. And then lastly, uh, I want to sort of talk about how this social production is potentially becoming antisocial in ways that no doubt you'll recognize. But I, I, again, I want to sort of frame the ways that we might be concerned about how networks are making us antisocial in terms of philosophy uh, in the specific ways that I'm going to lay out. And then with the time that we have left, uh, I'm happy to have a discussion to think about alternatives, basically. right? So I have some very sort of uh, loosey-goosey or speculative ideas about, on the basis of what I'm going to say, that might lead us to think about alternatives. Uh, we can use the time to talk about those alternatives, or I'm happy to just have a broader conversation with whoever's in the room uh, about your impressions about what I said and how you might uh, how you might fit into the kinds of ideas that I'm going to be presenting. So, just a, as a matter of kind of lingo that I've already sort of deployed, let me just say some of the following. So, what do I mean by a material semiotic medium? So, by material semiotic, what I mean is that unlike our popular understanding of a medium as a kind of generic substance through which culture takes place, right? So, we tend to think of a medium or media as just this kind of place where culture happens. It's a kind of uh, a virtual space where culture happens, if you like. For instance, I watch something on TV. The on TV part is to sort of take the medium of television as a kind of substance. Or I posted this to social media, and we just sort of think of it as a kind of generic substance. Um, when we include the term material semiotic, um, what we're trying to do is to really kind of keep track of the fact that there is always a specific mixture of technology and science and culture that are taking place in a medium. Right? And so this mixture is made up of things like invention, people coming up with new inventions, or technical standards, or protocols, or new materials that might come in and go into your device and change it in some way, or different technical components of that device, or maybe it's an innovative engineering strategies of one kind or another, whether in software or in hardware. These are all playing into the broader cultural expectations around meaningfulness uh, and the multiple functions of a medium in culture. So as we're using technology and interacting with media technology, um, culture happens through all of these other material dimensions, right? So I like the way that Grant Balmer puts it, uh, a scholar in my field who says, in their materiality, media define the limits for meaning and communication, right? So we need to keep track of the hardware in order to understand how things are meaningful in the world. And I just want to sort of say that as a kind of prefatory remark to sort of give you a flavor of where I'm coming from. Next, what do I mean by organized social production? So again, I was sort of intimating that a little bit in the start. I'm, I want to say that knowledge structures are really kind of now, at this point, are now structuring our collective habits and desires in these very sort of global and powerful ways. They are organizing and coordinating our habits and desires. Uh, and they do this by giving us a kind of philosophically justified set of principles about what it means to communicate with one another, right? So the kinds of philosophy that I'm going to be describing today, not only are they accounts of what it means to be alive or what it means to be thinking. It's all, they also kind of wind up acting through their projection into the technology. They wind up acting as a principle for communicative exchange for us. And in that sense, 
knowledge structures produce the social meaning that they kind of provide a generic or normative justification for our shared interactions with each other and with things in the world, right? So not just with one another, but also, you know, with smart devices or with when you take a picture of something and AI can recognize what it is. So it's not just with other people, it's also with things in the world. So it's a bit of a, to put it in a kind of obvious way, knowledge structures are a shared way of thinking, right? And it just an emphasis on the shared part. They, uh, and they also do this by helping us to regulate correctness in the world, right? So they, they're social also in the sense that they give us a kind of collective grounds for the possibility of error in different communi communities of practice. Um, they produce a kind of ground truth of factuality that we can take for granted and build upon, right? And that's kind of what some of the technologies I'm going to be talking about today, knowledge graphs, machine learning, social graphs, they sort of function as a as a sort of medium of consensus that we can take for granted and build upon. Uh, and these semiotics of objectivity are really kind of analogous uh, to the physical transfer of forces in a lot of ways, right? So they they sort of have effects in the world. They're not just, it's not just language. It's not just meaning kind of divorced from reality. Uh, these semiotics of objectivity that knowledge structures produce carry out a kind of transport of evidence from premises to conclusion as we communicate with one another and as we communicate with our devices. Again, right, so think about how Siri works. Siri gives you a correct answer that you can trust because it has this sort of, it, it has a sort of carriage of objectivity underneath it in terms of being, in terms of how we're communicating with Siri, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna sort of talk about that. Um, but importantly though, these objective principles are also social as, as I've been trying to suggest, we share them. And you might say that we kind of share them as a kind of collective fantasy in, in a certain way. They give us a, a sort of shared aspirational sense of what it means to be alive. They give us a kind of universalizing account of what it means to think together, right? So think for example, of Google's mission statement. Our mission is, and this is a quote, our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, right? So to both good and bad effects. So whether you believe that, that, that Google actually achieves that, nevertheless, it's a kind of aspirational sort of message that we can appreciate and understand in the context of living in a network society. Right, so Google achieves its mission by providing us again with this sort of reliable structures of consensus. They give us, Google gives us a ground for disagreeing with one another because it organizes us into a community of knowers. And, it, and, it, and that's a kind of form of social production, as I say. So to move on next to what I really wanna focus on, let me say that too often we take these universalizing accounts for granted, right? So we, we, we sort of assume that Google is just a kind of hive mind or a kind of global mind in this way that doesn't give a sort of philosophical due to what we actually might mean by that, right? Uh, we fail to recognize how these universalizing accounts of knowing kind of spring from accounts and debates in the philosophical tradition uh, about what it means to know, what it means to think in the first place, which has obviously been a sort of enormous, if not defining characteristic of philosophy for centuries, millennia potentially, right? So the reason behind why I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about next, um, the reason, so, so let me say that again, the reason behind uh, what I'm gonna talk about next goes something like this. Over the past few years, we've become more critically attuned as a society uh, to the ways that networked information systems may be failing us, right? So it's not just that we sort of appreciate the universalistic dimension of it, the fact that it's bringing us all together. Over the past few years, we've become much more critical about how our information systems are failing us. Uh, they are failing us in terms of political polarization, they are failing us in terms of distraction. They are failing us in terms of anxieties around the coherence of our identities relative to other groups of people. And they are also failing us in terms of disinformation. All right, so if all of this is the case, then included in all the political conversations we should be having and that we're starting to have about how we want things to change, how we might want information systems to change and do something different for us, whether that's a conversation around ownership structures and regulation, or whether it's about a conversation about alternative designs or and so forth, lots of different ways of approach, approaching these problems. But included in the discussion of those problems, we should be talking about the underlying commitments of what it means to think with and through computers at a very deeply philosophical level. level. And that's kind of what I'm gonna try and sketch out a little bit today. That's the main thing I wanna communicate, that a particular way that we have, a particular way of looking at philosophy's relationship to computing, or that we should want to have ways of looking at philosophy's relationship to computing. There's lots of connections between them. Uh, and so to get going on the sort of main thing that I wanna talk about, one way to generalize is to say that both information systems and philosophy 
are concerned with um, the determination and application of what are called principles of individuation. Right, so this is going to be a sort of key concept that I'm going to lay out for the remainder of the talk is to say, what is a principle of individuation and why should we be concerned with the, any principle of individuation as it applies or, or, or is projected into computing in some way? So let's start with this. What is individuation? What is a principle of individuation? A principle of individuation is about giving some rationale or a set of pre-established principles for how an individual emerges. And I don't just mean people. People are obviously an important part of it, but also how things in the world show up to us as individualized, right? So underlying that relationship, subject-object relationship, or the relationship between people and things, or people and other people, or people and phenomenon in the natural world, animals potentially, there is a, some philosophical account that turns on what is called a principle of individuation, which is how a set of principles for how an individual emerges. Now, some fancy language that comes along with this, offering a principle of individuation in philosophy is about giving some convincing justification that individual exists, that, that, that individuals exist, right? And this is, this is the technical term for this in philosophy is a thing's hexaity. To say that something exists is to say that it is uh, special and that it has individuality, and that's its hexaity. And you, you wind up with an account of hexaity by giving a rigorous account of what something, what an individual is, or what is called in philosophy, again, using the jargon, it's quiddity. So this is connection between these two terms, quiddity and hexaity, and philosophy has had sort of arguments and debates over whether quiddity defines hexaity or hexaity defines quiddity. Okay, so there's a couple ways that this happens. You can sort of see some of the philosophical figures here. So in the distant past, some of the basic ideas that we have about individuation, which are still with us in terms of how we think about classifying things with information systems goes back to um, you know the 13th and 14th century with someone like Don Don Scotus. Um, it goes back to philosophy by uh, people like Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, who thought of some of the original sort of principles of rationality upon which we have built computers. And then more recently, there has been a turn back towards thinking about individuation in French philosophy through people like Gilbert Simondon and Gilles Deleuze. Um, and the argument in philosophy basically runs like this. Again, how do you determine hexaity on the basis of quiddity or quiddity on the basis of hexaity by either A, giving some account of the determination of something's essence, what it, what it is that makes it what it is, or B, by explaining how it came to be through the conjunction of form and matter. So these are two very ground level concepts in philosophy that sort of, uh, where you can give an account of something um, and understand hexaity and quiddity by either one of these means. So in the first case of determining something's essence, think about how in relation to plants and animals and things in the world, you might describe a human being as a rational animal. So if you're gonna classify the world in all these different ways and you arrive at asking yourself what a human being is, you might say that a human being is different from everything else because it's a rational animal. And in fact, philosophy has done this for a very long time, back to Aristotle. Through the definition of what a human being is, it's quiddity, is that it is a rational animal, then from that definition of its quiddity, you'd be able to say that I am a rational animal. But my hexaity, I'm not just a rational animal. My quiddity is that I'm a rational animal. My hexaity is that I'm the particular human being called Neil Thomas, right? So through that system of classification that would define me as a human being, my hexaity is that I'm the particular human being that is Neil, named Neil Thomas, okay? So in this, and that's, that's sort of one way of thinking about individuation. In the second case of explaining how something came to be through the conjunction of form and matter, consider the example of a brick. Right, so a brick is what it is. Again, think it's quiddity. A brick is what it is as a result of a, of a process of formation in which a substantial form acts upon passive matter, in this case, clay. Right, so the, the brick's hexaity would be traditionally that it is one brick among many bricks in the process. Right, So I've been making bricks with this form the quiddity is the form of the brick. The hexaity is this brick and not that brick, right? So that's another way of thinking about quiddity and hexaity that is much more about a form-matter relationship. But not everyone agrees with this assessment that the that that it would just be this brick rather than that brick, because you might gesture, for instance, to the clay itself. You might ask, 
this clay is not just passive matter that receives form. The clay itself is active in the world. It's wet, it's dry, it's been around for this much time on the earth. It was formed through these natural processes. It's active in the world too. So wouldn't that change how you think about its hexaity? Right? So in other words, the point here is that not every philosopher thinks about the relationship to hexa of hexaity to quiddity as having its source exclusively in our thinking and not out in the world. So not all accounts of individuation begin by presuming the result of an individual subject or thinker. And in fact, certain philosophical traditions have worked hard to overturn such approaches, right? So there are people who just say, your hexaity is the kind of result of, of quiddity. And there are other people who say, no, we've actually argued that for a long time and it's caused all these conceptual problems. We should start from the other direction. We should think more carefully about hexaity, right? And so these kind of debates matter uh, in philosophy, but they also wind up telescoping into our, inf our information systems and mattering in terms of how we use uh, computers, especially in social computing today. So depending on the principle of individuation put forward, many philosophers allow quiddity to define hexaity or simply define thatness in terms of wetness. They allow identity to define the conditions under which things differ. Uh, but some contemporary philosophers critique this move and have tried to turn hexaity uh, or thatness uh, into a more constructive or even fundamental role in determining how things are. So accounts of individuation of this second type, the sort of critical type, tend to privilege difference as primary and they see identity as secondary. Okay, so and this will come to matter as we as I start to turn my attention a little bit more to things like knowledge graphs and social graphs and things that you'll that you'll recognize from uh, computer science or from your own use of computers. And so I'm going to show you a pretty wacky looking diagram in order to do that next. Uh, and, and from how I've arranged it, I've tried to capture some of the dynamics I've been describing so far. That some philosophers start from a focus on identity, and some start from a focus on difference. But speaking overall, a principle of individuation is meant to give a deep and sort of generic philosophical justification for how we distinguish something as one thing and not another, how we determine when there is numerically more than one of something, and also the conditions under which a thing undergoes change. Um, and just to bring this more into the context of computing now, uh, computer science and related fields have lately become more culturally sensitive and prone to debate uh, around the principles of individuation that are at work in databases and information systems more broadly. So for example, in the introduction to their edited volume called Raw Data is an Oxymoron, uh, Lisa Gittleman and Virginia Jackson point out how we tend to forget that, and here I'm quoting, uh, like events imagined and enunciated against the continuity of time, data are imagined and enunciated against the seamlessness of phenomenon. We call them up out of an otherwise undifferentiated blur. So this is a good way to sort of think about hexaity, the relationship between hexaity and quiddity when it comes to computers. There's a kind of hexaity out in the world, a kind of uh, variety out in the world, and we pull out what we think is significant from the world and we organize it into knowledge in the way that uh, Gittleman and Jackson are describing. So what they're saying is that reality is this kind of continuously unfolding process. It's made up of continuous flows of relation between living and non-living things. And through the application of some principle of individuation, we pull data out of the blur. Um, and for pragmatic reasons, you may not concern yourself much at all with, this well, with these well-established principles of individuation that are working in computer science. They've existed for a long time. They're well-established. They're stable. And so you might not think about them very much as you, you know, want to connect to an API or set up a database of some kind or do something with, your, with computing. Uh, you won't think much about these very well-established principles of individuation. Um, you simply think in terms of existing data. But it is also the case that sometimes new paradigms come along that cause a rethink around what people believe they're doing or trying to achieve using data. And this is where the principle of principles of individuation may flex and flow and come into play more significantly. So for instance, the historical or cultural break between rational planning-based artificial intelligence and newer machine learning artificial intelligence, or the difference between Web 1.0 and Web 2.0, these are examples where there is a kind of shift in our sense of how we individuate the world using connected computers in the first place. And I want to say that these are moments where we kind of reconsider the principle of individuation that's at work in our systems. And what I'm interested in is whether we might move in a different direction yet again by proposing some still different principle of individuation for social computing as it exists today. And the idea is that this might lead to a useful conceptual break 
or new patterns for thinking uh, that could address some of our more frustrating collective habits. Okay, so let's have a look at this weirdo diagram that I made. So here's how it goes. Um, first is, as I've been talking about, first is sort of hexaity. And as I pointed out a moment ago, um, I, when I was talking about the sort of arguments between philosophers, I'm cheating a bit by sort of preferring one side of that argument, the side of the argument that actually prefers starting from difference rather than starting from identity. And it's worth saying uh, that this is a bit of a non-standard definition of hexaity, but it's become more and more influential over the past few decades. Uh, and it's derived from the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, who defines hexaity as pure movement and rest in the universe. So as an example of this, think about how the seasons changing are just a kind of pure flux of difference. Or it, the fact that we will never revisit a date, a particular date in history, is an example of how uh, the world is just made up of flows of difference. And as I said earlier, a principle of individuation offers some pre-established rationale for how an individual emerges. It gives reasoning for how something shows up as something, right? So again, picking out from the undifferentiated blur, starting to pick out things that matter, right? I'm sort of trying to express this in the, in the way that the diagram is unfolding here. It gives reasoning for how something shows up as something, how we understand the thing to be one thing and not, a, not another thing, and how we might begin to compare and contrast between things by bringing them into relation. And so, again, relating back to networked and social computing, today's information systems have materialized different principles of individuation. And their different accounts of quiddity and hexaity uh, allow us to engage in social production through them, uh, to connect with other people, to make our lives more efficient, uh, to learn new things, uh, to reason together by sharing a principle of individuation. All of these things give us a kind of common ground for agreement and disagreement. Now, one, there, so this is, the, this is the sort of main diagram, but then the last thing I want to sort of throw in is the fact that when we do this, when we engage with a traditional principle of individuation, this notion that hexaity is just pure difference becomes something different. It goes from being pure difference to being specific difference. And I'm going to say that it's a kind of retrojective or backwards casting moment where we pull things out of the world and say that they're significant, we give a rationale for why they're significant, but in the process of doing that and in the process of setting up knowledge, we change the status of pure difference into specific difference or difference as classification for human beings, right? So there's a kind of a sweep moment. And, some, and again, some philosophers folk do not focus on this. They say, it just happens and we make knowledge. And some people say, it happens and we make knowledge, but what happened to pure difference? And that's a kind of important sort of distinction in sort of the way that people are talking about individuation today in philosophy. Um, so for instance, if you've encountered the school of thought known as post-humanism, or if you've heard of a movement in philosophy called new materialism, for example, the, the, their ideas are based in holding on to hexaity as pure difference rather than seeing hexaity as a secondary effect of quiddity. Right, so if I take the arrow away again, you'll see the arrow comes on and hexaity is redefined from being pure difference to being specific difference. And schools of thought like new materialism and its influence on posthumanism is to say, what about what happened to pure difference? We should be thinking about pure difference from the start rather than allowing specific difference to define pure difference. I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's kind of the thrust of what they're saying. So again, coming back to networked and social computing, the way that I began to approach this question when it comes to technology and the question of individuation, especially in relationship to the internet and the web, was to examine some of the major already existing styles uh, of individuation that underpin modern platforms. And I'm going to give you three thumbnail examples here, all taken from a book that I wrote a few years ago called Becoming Social in a Networked Age. So the three examples are knowledge graphs, social graphs, and predictive analytic graphs, which is just a term that I came up with to group together artificial intelligence related graphs. So machine learning graphs, I kind of call predictive analytic graphs, just to group together lots of different strategies and techniques under one sort of conceptual umbrella. And I'm going to associate a couple of thinkers in philosophy and computer science with each one for illustration purposes. Uh, but more importantly, I'm going to map how they function onto this diagram that I'm showing you, this diagram of individuation that I've built up so far. And at certain points, this will mean relabeling or reorganizing elements on the diagram a little bit as I go along, uh, but hopefully in a way that still communicates an understanding of where I'm coming from. And then I'll conclude uh, by sort of talking about why this might matter in a more sort of critical frame. 
Okay, so let's let's have a look at knowledge graphs. So here, a couple of representative thinkers are the American pragmatist Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, and I threw in Sir Tim Berners-Lee there, who's kind of responsible for how knowledge graphs took off front in the web uh, when it comes to his original ideas about the semantic web, which have since gone on to sort of penetrate, uh, the, been appropriated by companies in different ways to set up knowledge graphs. So the principle of individuation behind knowledge graphs has roots, as I just said, in the, in the ideas of Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, and they are based in the way that Peirce combined a philosophical accounts of signs in the world with relational algebra uh, to produce what he called existential graphs, which today we simply call knowledge graphs. And, and as you see, the, the diagram here didn't change very much. I don't need to change much in the diagram here from where I started, uh, but to be just a little bit more specific uh, to Peirce, Hexaity for him is understood in terms of reality being organized for human beings to individuate things through indexicality, or what he what he describes as saturating or fulfilling predicate slots. All right, so rather than so, if you've ever had to make a knowledge graph, even a small knowledge graph, you can understand them as being a kind of game of Mad Libs, where you're saying blank is a prime minister, blank is a prime minister of blank, and you organize the data into a kind of set of relations through empty predicates that need to be saturated by data that gets input into the knowledge graph. Okay, so Peirce, just talking philosophically about what Peirce had going, Peirce organized the three stages you see on screen here into what he called firstness, secondness, and thirdness, and connected them together such that our bare awareness, our hexaides, of being in an environment could rationally connect up to our recognition of things in the world, by right, saying, I, what is that? Or saying, that is a blank. Or, and then understanding how you can connect up those uh, statements about what something is up with other things and comparing and contrast them. So and so is not this, but it is that. How you might nest them into the conventional science systems that we share in society through today through knowledge graphs. So on the one hand, when it comes to knowledge graphs, on the one hand, meaning can be very flexibly styled as a cluster of kind of everyday statements that socially interrelate, no matter what these statements are about, right? So a knowledge graph can, you know, there's a there's a knowledge graph probably in my context of my phone that says so and so is my brother, so and so is my mother. Uh, that's a little knowledge graph that's contained in your phone, and it's very easy to understand how that's helpful relationally, because it socially matters. But on the other hand, this same cluster can gear into logic through Peirce's ideas, through the underlying pragmatics of analytic reference, right? So the saturation of predicates that I've been talking about. So the result is that knowledge graphs make it very easy to communicate on the terms of inductive, deductive, and abductive inference. And that makes that sort of incentivizes us to communicate our reality through the categorization of factual entities with attributes. These days, through these vastly distributed networks of facts, whether it's Google from Alpha or DBpedia or Google Knowledge Graph. Um, for example, I can expect Siri to correctly answer questions like, who directed 2001 A Space Odyssey? or what planes are above me right now. And the idea here is that we have Peirce's profound ideas about the signs relationship to algebra to thank for this functionality. His principle of individuation makes knowledge graphs possible. And what it means for us in terms of social production uh, is that we are kind of in a perpetual scientific pursuit of correct reference among an established community of knowers, all of whom, so we, by using our devices in this way, we all become sort of oriented towards the shared goal of making valid inferences and correcting each one another's mistaken assertions, right? So uh, this is what Peirce called fallibilism. It was his sort of uh, his sort of um, ethos of fallibilism, kind of under underlying or undergirding his his principle of individuation. So before moving on, I'm going to show you a couple of other ones uh, quickly. Before moving on, I want to suggest that in its widespread adoption via knowledge graphs, we may be encountering certain limits in Peirce's vision of science, right? So that we are running up against the limits of his principle of individuation in a sense. And the problem here is that his semiotic system assumes that we are all voluntarily participating in the technical art of producing settled signs, signs that are consensual, that we all agree on. Uh, Peirce's community consensus approach has much less to say about those aspects or approaches to truth that are about a kind of transformative unsettling of knowledge, right? How the sort of intrusive force of the new can come along and disturb and disrupt often through a kind of irreconcilable dissensus, right? So groups that do not have anything in common, they are, they are potentially frustrated by a Persian system because they can't even agree on a basic, a sort of basic principles of interaction uh, because their worldviews are so radically different. So for instance, in 2020, one way to put the problem is to ask, 
how can we ever expect knowledge graphs and the kinds of algorithmic systems and machine learning strategies to which they're connected uh, to kind of foster emancipatory ends of forcing people to encounter one another in their radical alterity or to forge new ways of thinking and living together that are somehow really strikingly discontinuous with how we've been living so far when it comes to the internet and web. Uh, when the underlying material semiotic techniques that Peirce uh, has sort of, that, that we sort of get through Peirce, um, they so thoroughly commit us to a principle of individuation that is sort of rooted in this continuous refinement of knowledge, right? That, that we can all, if, so long as we can all agree on things, we can keep building and evolving this giant knowledge graph. But the problem is that it doesn't really account for dissensus in satisfactory ways uh, that we might want it to. Um, next, we can look at a principle, the principle of, of individuation uh, in computing when it, and, and how it sort of shifts uh, when it comes to social graphs. So although the, uh, and so some of the people here that are relevant and sort of adjacent to philosophy or in philosophy, people like uh, Martin Heidegger, philosopher, uh, phenomenologist, um, the sociologist uh, Harold Garfinkel, who was very reliant on phenomenology in his sociology. Uh, you have certain appropriations of computer science from John Searle's work, an American philosopher uh, who came up with the idea of speech act theory. And then some computer scientists, people like Terry Winograd uh, or Lucy Suchman were responsible back in their era, their era, the 80s and 90s, to sort of think about how information systems needed to change away from a sort of purely Persian model to think more about social context. And then still later, ideas from an analytic sociologist by the name of Harrison White also sort of brought a more scientific view of sociology back into view um, by sort of pulling on, uh, and his, his ideas were sort of pulled on uh, to organize social networking analysis as we know it as a kind of social science. Right, so this is just a kind of cluster of people, a cluster of thinkers who are related to social graphs. So the idea here is that after the personal computer revolution and the rise and massification of the internet through the 1980s and 1990s, uh, the nascent field of human computer interaction design underwent what would become known as its contextual turn. And this, these are some of the thinkers that I pointed out were a part of this. So reflecting an emerging shift towards constructionist perspectives, uh, the turn to context developed in response to some of the rationalist approaches with Peirce that we just saw. Um, and from this perspective, the problem with the sort of way that uh, that we that people thought about signs in a Persian uh, vein was that logical meaning was kind of too limited to general and static rules and failed to account for the ongoing dynamic context of social meaning, of being together with other people as things show up for us in, in everyday environments. Right? And so this led in fields like computer-supported cooperative work and in the production of groupware, some of the early groupware software there was a kind of pivot towards thinking about things more sociologically, and this redefined hexaity. Uh, and it redefined hexaity in, in phenomenological terms. Uh, and the way that I put it here is hexaity changes from, uh, from being a kind of principle of knowledge to being a principle of kind of conversation with other people or conversation in the presence of other people or being socially accountable to other people. And in this case, hexaity becomes something that emanates from each one of us, right, in our kind of uh, in our lived experience, in our finitude, and the fact that we will be on the earth for a while and die, these are all sort of uh, features of the philosophy that went into rethinking hexaity in these terms, in terms of a kind of contextual ongoing social order uh, in which we kind of rebuild what it is that we think we know through conversations. And those conversations are, the, the sort of site of those conversations is what hexaity should be. Right, so it sort of redefines hexaity from being one thing to being a more social, conversational dimension of concrete everyday life. And so you get a movement from chains of reasoning to chains of performance. Right? So rather than saying, you know, so-and-so is from so-and-so city, you're saying something more like so-and-so uh, went to a concert with so-and-so, or so-and-so uh, belongs to the same group as so-and-so. Right? So these are examples of how you move from a kind of uh, a kind of epistemic uh, relation of knowing things, knowing facts in the world to watching people perform on the basis of those facts. Okay, I see that I'm already sort of starting to get over time, so I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. Um, uh, move on to the next slide, which is predictive analytic graphs, right? So again, this is the way that I'm sort of trying to think about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So here, uh, hexaity becomes something radically different. Hexaity becomes kind of psychological, 
uh, and it becomes cognitive. So if, if in the case of social graphs, hexady, uh, hexady is sort of defined in terms of uh, how I perform myself in conversational structures with other people in different contexts, predictive analytic graphs are much more about how those experiences of being in different groups fire neurons in my brain. And sort of, uh, and it's a much more sort of cognitive approach. And so people that are influential here from philosophy and computer science, someone like William James, another American pragmatist, or Walter Pitts and Warren McCulloch, uh, who invented the uh, sort of first sort of connectionist ideas about uh, artificial intelligence, or someone today who's very involved in, in sort of the pushing forward deep learning, someone like Jeffrey Hinton, they are all sort of committed to understanding hexaity as being about kind of neural association in your mind and that and that we our brains begin from a position of kind of unrestricted neural association and then through various by, by way of habit and by way of experiencing things in the world where we see resemblances or by trying to achieve things in the world by thinking about means ends relationships our uh, hexaity is defined in terms of how our brain gets connected together so radically different philosophically from the other two that I've just described and yet they, they have been chained together in such a way that's really fascinating to watch the last few years of how machine learning has sort of taken hold as a kind of, uh, as a kind of strategy for thinking together, but also a kind of mythos around what we think we're doing in the economy and, uh, and what, how you think you'll be having a job or a vocation in the coming years, right? So um, again, sort of simultaneously technical and social. And what it leads to is to think about uh, how uh, computer, science, computer science graphs can act uh, as a matter of automatic reckoning, as a matter of automatically predicting things, not just as a kind of, uh, as a supplementation to the existing social order, but fundamentally sort of redefining the social order in terms of this capacity for automated predi automatic prediction. So just for the sake of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave us with this last slide here, that the concern here, why we should be concerned with the principle of individuation in all of these cases, and why we might wanna think about, uh, about projecting still other principles of individuation into social computing to change what it is now is that uh, as the Bernard, as the philosopher Bernard Stiegler uh, remarks, these systems are constructing uh, in a lot of ways are constructing principles for our industrial disindividuation. So what he means by that is however much we think that this is the model of how artificial intelligence works, that we are modeling brains, what's really going on is that these massive companies are restructuring are restructuring our hexaities to feed them as if they were the hexaities of a brain of one brain, but in fact it's the hexaities of them as a platform or as a system, right? So our hexaities, our social hexaities, and the ways that we manipulate and organize facts in the world are being captured by these systems, and through the neuronal sort of metaphor. They are being turned into in the the data that we're leaving behind is being turned into hexades for a computational brain in a lot of ways, just to kind of compress the metaphor down, right? And so, it, so the problems that we think that we're suffering are around our use of social media and the fact that these companies are sort of running ahead of us in all of these substantial ways need to be addressed at this philosophical level because otherwise we're going to wind up with systems that disindividuate us, as Stiegler says which is to say that we will have, we will lose uh, a kind of autonomy of thought because we will be so heavily projected into these predictive systems that sort of define us in ways that are not individualizing to us, but are rather individualizing to us, which is to say, organizing us into hexaities to get us ready for the individuation of companies rather than the individuation of ourselves. So I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the remarks there and just, um, uh, we can talk a little bit in the remaining time. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Um, open to questions uh, from the live stream. Uh, <coughs> sure. There are simply not enough users here to have a good chat. Perhaps. I see folks that are typing, so I'm going to and slowly talk and see what comes up in the live stream chat. Um, we do have a few minutes. Uh, 
before the next session. So uh, I think we can uh, hang out a little bit. I don't mind talking to the void. That's OK. Gary was here to listen to me. <laughs> What's that? Ah, here's Elon. OK. Somebody else, you're also on the live stream chat. Oh, so, great. OK. Yeah. But if you also, if we run out of time, you can definitely jump in to the live stream chat um, on rocketchat.outernetworks. Um, can you uh, paste the link of that into the browser? Or is it... uh, I see that folks have uh, a lot of thoughts in their minds. Um, and maybe not, not enough time to really kind of construct those thoughts and put them into questions right now. Yeah, sure. That's totally fine. I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy that it's being recorded. I'm happy to be, uh, to have conversations with people down the road as they, as they process what I have to say. Uh, you know, my, you can reach out to me on Twitter or you can, uh, shoot me an email or whatever. And I'm, I'm happy to sort of have a conversation with everyone. Um, I do see a question from from Jim. Um, I don't see any. Uh, I don't see many popular communities built around uh, the base of knowledge graphs. I'm wondering if that's uh, partly due to heavy concentration, uh, contraction, and centralization. Yeah, and no, I think that's fair, right? I think that there was, you know, going back to what Sir Tim Berners Lee sort of originally envisioned, right? He, as and yet it was a very sort of universalistic sort of aspiration as to what was possible and how. How linked data would sort of intersect and interact with with uh, between different organizations and groups, uh, and then I think you have sort of witnessed this sort of um, in, in in the name of sort of uh, probably in the name of driving artificial intelligence systems or uh, or in the name of sort of streamlining business procedures or legal procedures between businesses. There's uh, there's been a sort of particular uh, sort of thrust or direction for for uh, for knowledge graph style stuff. I mean, I think that some exceptions might be in the scientific community, where you have people who are doing kind of, um, you know, natural taxonomies and relying on XML and RDF to be able to do it. I think that's a good example of of a kind of uh, a particular knowledge graph community that's that's really developing developing things uh, in an interesting direction. Um, more generally, though, I guess I guess the critique is more about the kind of logic, the underlying logic of it, right? Uh, and whether whether there is value in, in sort of speculating about other principles of individuation that are not just about sort of, you know, even, and, and they happen in social media too. So Facebook has a knowledge graph about us. That's, you don't have to call it a social graph necessarily. You could call it a knowledge graph about people, right? And, and you could sort of say that's accumulating and we seem very much sort of habituated or addicted to it. Uh, and so what, do, what will it take? Will it take us to come up with a more public facing platform publicly owned or publicly sort of controlled platform that is like Facebook? Or does it make sense to think in terms of, is there some other principle of individuation of how someone might want to be social that could take hold on altogether new platforms that are not like Facebook, that just do something different from Facebook, they're not just a variant on it like Elo or something like that, right? So it's kind of two two strategies and both are really important, I think, but that um, that's how you sort of, it's, it's one other way of thinking about how you would go about forging some new sense of what community could be, basically. Cool. And um, another question, uh, what's the epistemology of blockchain? Of uh, blockchain, oh, that's a really interesting one. Uh, what's the epistemology of blockchain? I mean, it's very, it's uh, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, I'd have to think about that, but immediately, it, it, I mean, it feels, it feels kind of libertarian to me, or it feels very, uh, as a principle of individuation, it's intensely private. Right, and I, I, you know, I think that that's I admire that in the sense that it's uh, that it's that it, it is about breaking out of the individuating strategies of existing companies and sort of saying we're going to go do our own thing and we're going to we're going to the context under which our own thing is going to emerge is going to have nothing to do with this because it's so 
it's cryptographically sort of secured or cryptographically organized just as from the from the get-go. So I think it's really interesting for that. But then I also think that it leads to uh, a kind of libertarian mindset that is not that doesn't that isn't really thinking necessarily about the collective, or if it is, it's thinking about it from a, a really sort of anarchic principle that might not flow together in the way where you would have emerging governmental structures uh, that are um, I don't know distributed in the in the right way. I mean, I don't know. It's 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 complicated. I think it's a really interesting, really fascinating question, particularly in the in the, in the ways that people are moving on from thinking about it strictly as a currency to thinking about it as a kind of social production of, you know, I'm giving you bandwidth or I'm producing this and I'm going to get it back in credits to, for me to be able to watch or stream video in some other context, right? The way that it's like falling directly onto media objects away from being a kind of style of money to just being a kind of style of production directly in a form of digital production that's that's keyed to whatever it is, whatever it is that the community wants to do. I think that that's, that's really fascinating too. So yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the, potentially final question. Um, do you have any vision of what the new system would look like? Yeah, so let me, I'll turn the, I'll turn the screen back on and I'll show you this last slide. It's, it's ridiculous because it's so speculative, but uh, it might be interesting. Let's see. There. Okay. So, um, so, I mean, a big a sort of fundamental part of going back to this, some of the stuff that I said at the very, at the very beginning around how there are uh, debates in philosophy around the status of hexaity and its relationship to quiddity. So that some people, you know, most traditional philosophy, most philosophy that's informed computer science has been very much focused on, on quiddity as being an identity as being primary and hexaity and, and pure difference as being secondary. Newer philosophy of the form of Gilles Deleuze and another philosopher of technology that I really like, Gilbert Simondeau, starts from the position of pure difference, starts from the position of hexaity and says, it's hexaity all the way down. We shouldn't, we have to sort of, we have to, we have to, we have to think, uh, sort of think past, uh, th think quiddity in terms purely in terms of difference, right? And so, um, other philosophers that have thought in this way are uh, someone like Alfred North Whitehead is another is another sort of influential person who thinks in this way who thinks difference long before they think of identity, um, and the later Heidegger also thinks in these ways, right? And so, I, I just think that so far we've had certain currents, certain countercurrents in philosophy that have sort of had momentary effects in computer science the, the heidegger and his Earl being good examples of of you know the heideggerian position really shifting uh, especially in the context of personal the rise of personal computers uh, and sort of how you can be emancipated through your personal computer or something back in the 1980s uh, that that sort of gave way to a sort of more heideggerian position on what a computer is or a computer could do but i also think that that's been now thoroughly appropriated by platforms by the big platforms and therefore we need to go back to different again different styles of philosophy so here you can sort of get some flavor of that. It's be like, we're not, we're not trying to classify things anymore. We're just trying to express ourselves, and our expressions are a product of our own hexaity, uh, but they all they're always differential to other people, right? So in a, in a certain way, it would be, and again, this is just entirely speculative to say the 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 set of controls that Google or Facebook has over our hexaities as organized into one centralized platform. What would it mean to distribute those hexaities back down? into communitarian more communitarian or public facing systems uh, and reorganize them in such a way that they just don't they don't percolate up into quiddity in quite the same way that's about all i can say about that right now it's very vague i recognize but it's kind of where i'm thinking cool um there, there is a another question here around uh bernard Steiber. um who else might you point to as contemporary thinker to that considers the topic of this individuation um, or are there other platforms models that you know of that put into practice a break from the systems of individuation? Yeah, so it's all, yeah, so it's it's different styles of individuation. So everything is all, each system is individuating. Um, so I guess the places that I would point you to, uh, so yeah, for sure, Bernard Stiegler. And Bernard Stiegler relies on the work of Gilbert Simondon, who I've already mentioned a couple of times. His account of individuation is really fascinating because it it, it includes a very, very rich and engineering uh, it's sort of inflected uh, account of what individuation is. Uh, and it's, his account of individuation is very different from other people. It's very historically accurate in the sense that he argues his way out of uh, tradition, but he has very new things to say. And his recent work, his work is very recently translated. It's about to come out. It was supposed to come out in July, a very famous book, or his uh, his most famous book called uh, Forms, of, Forms of Information in the Light of Form or something like that. Um, I don't have the exact title, but it was supposed to come out in July. 
uh, and then his family wanted to look at, look at better, look more closely at the translation. So it's been delayed until October. But if you look up this book, Gilbert Simondon's Forms of Inform uh, Forms of in Information in Light of Forms of Individuation, I think is the name of the title, and it's it's um, Minnesota Press is putting it out, and that'll be a really a really fascinating read uh, for you, I think. And then uh, Mark Hansen is another person who's uh, who wrote a book called Feed Forward, where he's using Whitehead to try to think about what impact artificial intelligence and machine learning, and again with a, a more informed attitude around what machine learning is and does than most people in media studies. Mark Hansen is, it's a complicated read, uh, and it's his own sort of very, somewhat idiosyncratic read, but Mark Hansen's book, Feed Forward, is, is quite rich in terms of describing some of the landscape that I've been sort of laying out here. In terms of platforms, though, I haven't seen anything existing yet. I mean, you know, you could, I'd be happy to see something interpreted through the lens of what I'm saying that would be amazing, but I haven't seen any platforms that is either specifically committed to these to these ideas or, or is expressing them in a way that, that I would instantly recognize or something. Cool, awesome. Um, I think that brings us to close to the session. Uh, thanks again, Neil. Yeah, great. No, it's great to it's great questions and thanks a lot for everyone that listened.